to encourage you to open your Bibles to the Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 2. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 2. And wow, if you enjoyed that, you're going to enjoy this evening. And I hope you will um, listen to the service online, The what's normally a senior adult Valentine's banquet. Uh, but it's really open to anyone this evening. So you can hear more information about it, how you can listen to this Online. This is on page 858 in the chair Bible. If you don't have your own Bible, uh, find this on page 858 in the Bible and chair in front of you. From God's Word, I'm reading Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse number 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old... They went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. As we think about our theme, Jesus, no other name, I want us to think this morning particularly about one aspect of Jesus' life, Jesus as a person, and that is his humanity. I want us to see that Christ did not appear as a full-grown man, that he didn't just emerge out of the wilderness and come out among the people, but Jesus grew. Jesus became man. So today I'm, I'm going to be talking about that, the humanity of Jesus. Maybe you've not ever given much thought to this idea of the humanity of Jesus. I want us to see this as a core doctrinal belief, a core component of our Christian faith, the humanity of Jesus. And then we're going to look at the one record we have of Jesus' life between his birth and the beginning of his public ministry. Only one, and it's right here in this text. I want to go a little further and focus on some of the considerations of just one of the verses. We're going to look at, at this passage in general, but hopefully uh, unpack some of the rich truth found in verse number 52 and then see how this all applies. So that's where I'm going this morning. Let's start with the humanity of Jesus. Again, most Christians have probably not thought much about Jesus' humanity, at least not from a doctrinal understanding. If you ask a Christian, do you believe Jesus is divine, that he is the divine Son of God, it's unconscionable to think that a Christian would deny that Jesus is divine. In fact, I would go so far as to say, if you don't believe that Jesus is divine, if you don't believe he's God, you're not a Christian. So most Christians, probably no Christian, has any problem 
with the divinity of Jesus. But when we really press into this idea of his humanity, that God took to himself humanity, that he became flesh, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word, the eternal Word, the second person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the three in one, the second person of the Trinity took on, added to his divine nature, a human nature. The word incarnation means in flesh or in the flesh. So that's what we're talking about in this first component of that outline I've given you. That the humanity of Jesus, the incarnation, in flesh, that Jesus became flesh. In his incarnation, the eternal divine son took into union with himself a complete, that's an important word, a complete human nature without sin. This is the humanity of Jesus. As a result, the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, now forevermore, He eternally existed as the second person of the Trinity in His incarnation when He took on human flesh. He now and forevermore exists as one person in two natures, both the divine and the human. He didn't cease or leave off his human nature or his body that he came and assumed. He didn't shed that when he went into heaven. He is in heaven at the right hand of God the Father in a and with a body. He will return with a body. So the divine nature, the human nature, these are, these are both essential for salvation. He had to be God to atone for our sins. He had to be perfect. The sacrifice had to be perfect. But God couldn't, can never die. God can't die. God can't end. God is eternal. God will always be. So a man had to die because man certainly can die. Jesus taking on human nature is hard to wrap our heads around if you reason well I've got this yep he was God he was man fully man fully God I mean I'm, I'm honestly going to tell you uh, when I started when I laid these sermons out between the week of Christmas and New Year's and I I, I thought through this as I thought about this this um, series of sermons on Jesus the name that is above, that is above every name and I thought about different uh, ideas biblically, theologically that I hope to communicate when I thought about the humanity of Jesus uh, again I'm just sketching I'm outlining um, I really did not think this would be that difficult of a sermon to prepare S some sermons are a preacher knows some ser sermons are easier and some are harder and I really put this in the category mistakenly so that that this may not be that challenging. But this past Monday when I started to work on this sermon, uh, I started in an unusual place. I, I didn't really start with the text. I started by taking four systematic theology books off of my shelf. I found the section that deals with the person of Christ and specifically the pages that deal with His humanity. And I was just awestruck as I considered these, these great writers, these great theological minds that based their writings on Scripture and just parsed out the, the implications of the fact that God took to Himself human flesh. One of these theologians said, the doctrine of the two natures in one person transcends human reason. It is an incomprehensible mystery. And I, and I was already, couldn't put it in those words, but I was already thinking, 
this is way beyond what I remembered studying. This is deeper than, than I've plunged as I reread this. Maybe as a seminary student, I read these textbooks or the sections required reading quite honestly because I knew there was either going to be a paper to be written on it or a test. Maybe I was not the best student. I know, I know that I wasn't. But even as I reread some of this rich uh, doctrinal teaching, th this statement, it's an incomprehensible mystery. It is. So just like you cannot and I cannot understand the Trinity, the Father, the Son, eternally existing, one God, eternally existing in three persons, you, you can't wrap your head around that. There's no chart. There's no diagram. There are no analogies. They all fall short. And to try to tease out and understand and say, well, I get this. I fully understand the person, the second person of the triune God assuming humanity Adding, not, not subtracting his divine nature, but adding to it humanity, it, it is mind-boggling. And so the, the author was correct. It is an incomprehensible mystery. Professor Stephen Wellam, uh, two of our pastors studied uh, under this professor, wrote, The Son permanently added a human dimension to his personal divine life, and became present to us in a new mode of existence as the incarnate Son. Oh, I wish you could just let that marinate in your heart and head. I, I wish the, the weight of that sentence that the Son permanently wasn't just a... He needed this for 30 years on earth. He, he needed this for some 33 years here. He permanently added a human dimension to His personal wasn't separated from him. It, two natures that, that, that are distinct, that are different in one person. He, he added this to his divine life and became present to us in a new mode. This, this had not previously been in a new mode of existence as the incarnate Son. A human nature like us with the exception of sin. So Jesus was fully human. And he experienced what it is to be fully human. All the effects of living in a fallen world. But he did not share the guilt or the disposition that Adam's sin passed on to us. So that's the difference. Everything else like us. But he did not inherit Adam's sin as we were born with and was passed on to us. So what do we know about Jesus' human nature? All four Gospels talk about Jesus' life. About half of the Gospels focus on his passion, his, his redeeming work. They tell of his miracles, they tell of his teachings, but especially, uh, John gives about half of his gospel to the last week of Jesus' life. So, the, the gospels give an account of his three-year public ministry, but devote nearly half of their space to the final week of his life. The passage that I read, I trust your Bibles are still open to Luke chapter 2, provides the only record we have of Jesus' life between his birth and the beginning of his earthly ministry at 30 years of age. So there's this, this wide gap between birth and the beginning of his public ministry, as Luke 3.23 tells us, 30 years of age. And in that wide gap, there is this, this one snapshot, this one picture of Jesus in his um, young life. This is the one record we have. So, as we look at these verses, just glance over them, verse 41 to 52. Joseph and Mary take Jesus on an annual trek from Nazareth to Jerusalem. They make this 
trip to one of the required feasts. And they participate in this feast that would have lasted seven days. At the end of the feast, they go home. They begin their journey back. And they forget Jesus. Or so it appears they forget him. Now, maybe a good question is, how do you forget the Son of God? How do you leave Jesus behind? Do keep in mind that he, he is at this point a 12-year-old boy. I just wonder about the boys in this room. How many boys in this room are, say, between the ages of, we'll just say 10 to 14. Hold your hand up, fellas. No, between 10 and 14. Don, you're not between 10 and 14. <laughs> That's okay. Hold them up, fellas, 10 to 4. Would you boys, I know I did ask a few of you to be willing to do this. I didn't ask you all if you're like, I really don't want to do this. You don't have to. But I'm just asking, would you boys mind standing up across here? It'll just be about two minutes I'll ask you to stand here. If you're between the age of 10 and 14, fellas, this will help me. Would you all come up here? Oh, yeah, come on. Let's give them a hand. All right, so uh, these guys are ranging between 10 and 14. There's, I'm sure, I know of one 12-year-old, right? Raise your hand if you are 12. Okay, fellas, first of all, I want to thank you all for standing up here just for a minute. Take a look at these handsome young boys. Think in terms of, of Jesus, Think in terms of our Lord Jesus in humanity at 12 years of age. Would he have looked like this? Obviously, he, he would Middle Eastern. His complexion would have been different. His dress would have been different. But Jesus was a 12-year-old boy. He was a 10-year-old, 11, 13, right on through. But this is just a, um, a, a kind of a snapshot of thinking of Jesus about this age maybe about this size, when his parents make this trip from Nazareth to Jerusalem. Thank you, fellas. Y'all can go back to your seats. Let's give them a better hand than we gave them when they came up here. That was not an easy thing to do when you're a little, a young man, and you're asked to stand in front of the whole church. So here's, here are the parents. They take him on this re required uh, journey. At the end of it, he's left behind. The question is, how do you leave, a, how do you leave the Son of God? How do you forget Him? Has anyone, has any, has any parent uh, ever left, we're not going to call defects or anything like that, but you've ever forgot your child? You ever left your child somewhere? Anyone? Okay, a few of you are honest. <laughs> I have. You know where I left mine? Stephen. We left him at church. Yeah, two different cars, uh, common thing, pastors come separately from their families. Sunday night, uh, walked in the kitchen, where's Stephen? Where is Stephen? <laughs> you brought him home. No, you were going to bring him home. You cannot have an argument right after you've just preached a Sunday night sermon, but immediately no time to argue, just time to come back. He was fine, all was good. Um, Maybe y'all have got, I saw a couple of hands go up. Well, Jesus being left behind here was um, quite understandable because they traveled in caravans. They walked, and the women and smaller children walked up ahead, and the men and the older children, particularly the older boys, would have had a, a separation, a distance, and they would have taken up the rear. And so obviously Joseph assumed and Mary assumed she has Jesus, he has Jesus, there's a large crowd, they make a day's journey, at the end of one day, they realize, where's Jesus? I thought it was you, no, I thought it was you. You, you had him, no, no one has him. Another day, day two, the trek back. A third day of searching, there's a lot of people still mingling, remaining in Jerusalem. So a day of searching and they find Jesus, and we, you can't miss the 
uh, exasperation and the relief that any mother would feel, but also the, uh, we'll, we'll say anger, we'll say being upset. Verse 49, um, or I'm sorry, verse 48, son, why have you treated us so? What do you think she's saying? What were you thinking? What, what were you doing? Your, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. We might say, we've been worried sick about you. What were you doing? She's, she's feeling this, this angst. She's upset. And then we find the first recorded words of Jesus in the New Testament. Very first thing that the Bible records that he said. Verse 49. Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Is this the moment in his humanity that Jesus, as a human, understood his divine nature? Is, is this in that component of his being when it became real to him? Did it happen earlier? Is this when he's sort of bringing Mary and Joseph in on this? It's interesting, verse 50, that they did not understand the saying that, that he spoke to them. I, I, actually, I read this, and even now I think back to the narrative of his birth and how profound that was. Surely there must have been some thoughts to that, that glorious night when he was born and the, the shepherds coming because of the angelic choir's announcement. But nonetheless, they don't understand. They... Um, went down, he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. His mother treasured up all these things in her heart. She's pondering them. So these words reveal something. They reveal his recognition of his unique relationship to his father. So I want to just give a question to parents. Parents and, and grandparents. This is a question to Think about, what are you doing, what are you doing to impact the lives of your children spiritually? Grandparents, think about that. Parents, think about it. What are you doing to impact the lives of your children spiritually? I, I want you to understand that this trip was a hard journey. By law, Mary was not even required to make this trip. This is not getting um, in a car and driving 70 miles. This is traveling either by foot or by donkey. This is a, a hard journey. Uh, they, they're traveling, they're, they're rising in elevation as they close in on Jerusalem. There is a huge commitment made by Mary and Joseph to take Jesus to this required feast that Mary didn't even have to go to. She could have easily said, I'll stay home. I think it speaks volumes of their commitment to the religious training of Jesus. And to that end, parents, just want to encourage you to know, remember, that you are the primary spiritual teacher, discipler of your children. It, it is not on anyone else. It is Others can come along, and others should come along. We should all join in. But primarily, primarily, you are the one who gives spiritual guidance. So I want to encourage you in that. Let's focus on some considerations from Luke 2.52. As we just come to that last verse of this chapter. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature, and in favor with God and man. I think we tend to read Luke chapter 2, primarily the first five or six verses, and then we, we get into the, the angel and the, the, the multitude of angels telling the shepherds, and we love that part of the chapter, and, and we know a little bit more or maybe a little bit less about uh, 
Jesus being taken to the temple for the dedication. But we just kind of like race through this end of the chapter where I've just read and, and we have Jesus as a young boy, a 12-year-old boy. The, the typical human 12-year-old boy with, with all of the, the challenges of that transition from boyhood into young manhood and then on into, into adulthood. So God could have sent a full-grown Christ, but He didn't. He sent him in the form of a baby and we don't know very much at all other than what we know right here that he, he grew. He, he, we saw, I didn't read it, but we could go back to verse 40. The child grew. He became strong. And here in specifically, as we think about some considerations on this verse, he grew in stature. As a human, he matured. It's one of the joys of being a pastor is watching over, over years, watching children. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to have seen children born. I haven't seen any of your children born, but I've seen children in our church when they're born, after they're born, when they're, they come to church as a baby, right on up to, in some cases, their, their weddings. And, and them having children. So, so just as we grow physically, if, if we could bring those same boys back in 10 years or 15 years, they would look totally different. Look at those childhood pictures of yourself or of children that you know and look at the changes. So Jesus grew in stature. He He matured. So, what, what does this say? Well, I'll just give you an example. With all due respect to the author of the Christmas Carol, Away in a Manger, I just want to make this personal, how, or how we can understand Jesus growing in stature. The, the line, the little Lord Jesus, no crying He makes. Those are just simply not true words. He did cry. He, he was a human. Babies cry. The, the Bible tells us everything we need for life and godliness, but it doesn't fill in all the gaps. We, we approach the Bible as objective truth, not as a subjective consideration, but as objective truth. We, we hold it up as the inspired, infallible, and errant Word of God. But the Bible doesn't fill in every single gap. And so I, I have to believe that most certainly Jesus cried. He was a human. I have to believe that there were nights that Mary said, Joseph, you're going to have to go get him. You get up this time. You bring him in here. And perhaps Joseph snored right through her request. Jesus was, was real. He was, the idea that he did not cry is if that's what the, the song, now that's your favorite Christmas carol, don't worry, we're still going to sing it. I, I'm, I'm not axing or Xing out the song. It, I just want you to know that Jesus was real, that he cried. As an infant, he, he would have nursed. And just like a baby's burped, what does a baby do after he burps or, she's, or after she's burped? They oftentimes spit up. Now, that is one of the hard things about being a parent is diapers are one thing. That spit up is a unique odor that is just hard to get off of your shirt. Jesus would have spit up. What, what do babies, what should they do if, they're, if they don't do this? You've got to call the doctor. They, they need their diaper changed. Jesus, I don't know what it was. I know it wasn't a pamper, but Jesus had to have his diaper changed. He, he, he would have soiled a diaper or wet in a diaper. He was, he was real. He had to learn to talk just like every other boy or girl. And how, does he, how do you learn to talk? 
You listen. You hear what others are saying. He, at, at six months old, he was not reciting the Old Testament. You've been around children as they're learning to speak and they, they develop at different stages. But as a parent, I've, I've, and as a grandparent, listening to children talk and sometimes it's like, I have no idea what he just said. And, and, and who can always know? Who always knows what he said? Mama. Mom knows what he said. Grandmother often knows. Or a sibling close in age. I, I, I've heard in, in my grandchildren, I've heard one of them say something when they were beginning to babble and talk. And, and an older sibling said, oh, she just said, da, 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 da. wow, how, did you, how do you interpret that? So Jesus would have learned to talk. He would have learned to roll over and crawl and pull himself up and take his first steps like any other baby. He would fall down as he played with other boys. As he ran and played, he would have fallen. He would have skinned his knee and he would have ran crying to his mother Mary to hold him and kiss away the hurt or to pat the hurt. Or to embrace him and say, it's going to be okay. Now go play. Now if you're thinking, I just have never read that in the Bible. What book is that in? I'm not telling you you're going to find scripture and verse for this. I'm just telling you Jesus was human. He took human flesh. He was not unlike us. He got sleepy. He got hungry. He got thirsty. He got tired. He felt the pain of rejection. He felt the agony of a scourging and the agony of a cross. He was fully human. So he grew. He, he grew in manhood. He grew in wisdom. He grew in mental and emotional intelligence. Just as he grew physically, he grew mentally. He created all things, but in his addition to a human, of a human nature, he still learned. He still had to learn. He still had to acquire intellectual knowledge. He would have had to learn the Old Testament Scriptures. He would have had to have heard this and learned this. And certainly he would have learned it from his mother and Joseph. He grew in favor with God and man. That means he, he grew spiritually and he grew relationally. There's If we think about these Young men that stood here, this, this is, we've all been there, right? Every, every male remembers those ages that you're, you're maturing, you're growing. And, and you, you grow relationally, you grow intellectually, you grow in stature. And Jesus, the human Jesus grew I just want to encourage you mentally and, and as far as mental and emotional intelligence, I hope you're growing in that. I, I hope you're seeking to grow. That you're, you're not just saying, oh, I, I, I don't want to read anything. I don't need to learn anything. Listen, if you're done learning, you're done. If you can't learn anything new, if you can't learn a new way to do something, if you can't learn from a person older than you or a person even younger than yourself, if you're too prideful that, that a young person can't tell me anything, oh, yes, they can. And certainly, sometimes, old does not mean necessarily that you're spiritually mature, but older certainly should have some life lessons that we should learn from. And so I just want to encourage you to grow mentally, grow emotionally. I, I, I've heard preachers, um, I'm just going to tell you, I shouldn't tell you this, but I'm going to tell you. I, I've actually heard preachers say, you know, I don't need any commentaries. I don't want to learn. I don't need any. I just give me the Bible and I'll read the Bible and I'll just get up and say whatever God gives me. I, that, that may sound like that's a very spiritual man. I don't think so. If you, if you suspend the writing of all the years of church history, the writings of, of godly men who have gone before us, 
who had deep thoughts about God, who, who dug into the Scriptures, who are gifted in communication, and, and you don't avail yourself to learn from others. And that's not, hey, that's not just for a preacher. You should be learning. You should be growing intellectually. You should be growing in your mental and your emotional intelligence and in favor with God by pressing in to know the Lord and in favor with man, growing relationally. So how do I apply it? This is the last point on your listening guide. How do I apply all of this? I've already spoken to parents, but I want to restate my point another way. And here it is. Parents, seek to so honor Christ in your daily lives that if your child walks away from the faith, they cannot point to you as an excuse. I want to urge you parents to consider that. And I want to say that very as tenderly as I can because I understand that there are godly men and women who have labored over, prayed for, taken their kids to church, taught them right from wrong, pointed them in the right direction, and adult children or teenage children have drifted or gone from God, gone far from God. And so I, I'm, I'm going to give the, the caveat that there is always this dynamic that there are adult children who are going to make their minds to do what they want to do, and they're going to walk away from the Lord. But as much as it is within you, seek to so honor the Lord and live your daily life so that if your child walks away, they're not going to be able to point to you and say, it's because of what I saw as a big inconsistency, a big hypocrisy in your life. No child can, mine included, no child can look at their dad or their mom and say, she was perfect, he was perfect. Every child can look at their parent and see deficiencies and weaknesses. But as a way of life, as a, as a pattern of life, parents seek to honor Christ in your daily life so that if your child walks away, they're not going to point to you as an excuse. And I'm sure I'm speaking to some that says, I wish I'd heard this 20 years ago. May I just encourage you, if you're not only now hearing this, may I give you a pastoral encouragement. God is able to redeem, as Joel, the prophet Joel said, God can redeem the years that the locusts have eaten. In other words, what Satan meant to destroy, what devastation may have come into our lives because of our waywardness, our sin, our neglect. You turn your life over to Jesus. You give yourself fully to the Lord for whatever length of time God gives you and let that be your legacy. Maybe, this, maybe the first 40 years of your life were not what you wanted them to be. But brothers and sisters, the last 40 years or 50, whatever time God gives you, the last five years, let it be known that you are a woman, you are a man. Let them see you now that you are pursuing the Lord. One of the things in my own personal journey is seeing my dad about the time, probably middle school, high school, seeing a spiritual transformation in my father's life. And seeing my dad read his Bible every evening. And my dad had some of, some of this, some of, you can't relate to this, many of you can. My dad had a very limited education, a fifth grade education. So he, he did not have a lot of, uh, he was a smart man, you had to do a lot of things, but didn't have this vast academic background. And I remember asking my dad once, I didn't know where it was, I'd never heard of a concordance, and I don't think he had either, but I remember saying, Daddy, where's the Ten Commandments? Now, some of you, right now, if your kid asks you that, you could open your Bible and you say, right here, son, daughter. Some of you may... We didn't have these then. You couldn't, you couldn't say, Siri, where's the Ten Commandments? So he didn't know. But I, I, here's what I remember watching my dad do. He was digging, looking. They're in here. I'm going to find them. 
He, they're in here, son. And it was the next day. I maybe asked somebody at work. I don't remember, but I remember him coming home and telling me where the Ten Commandments were. Spoke to me. Spoke, it spoke volumes to me. So let the rest of your life be gospel-focused. Number two, keep growing. Just as Luke 2.52, Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God and man. Keep growing. You don't know it all. You still have a lot to learn, as do I. One respected Bible teacher said, Are we to think of Jesus as a baby in the manger looking up at the stars and contemplating the physics of the universe that he created? He wrote, I don't think so. (laughs) Of course he didn't. Jesus, in his human nature, kept growing. He, He learned. So I have a question for you. If Jesus grew intellectually, if he grew in favor with God and man, if he read from the Old Testament scroll, here's your question. What are you doing to keep growing spiritually? You know what you're going to do next week professionally. You know what you're going to do on your job. What are you doing? What are you planning right now to do to help you grow spiritually next week? Is there anything on your radar that I'm going to do this to help me grow spiritually? I hope you'll, you will begin to think in terms of, of a devotional life, of reading a good book. We've got a library full of good books. We've got a book stall in the lobby that has great resources. You have a superfluous amount of information on the internet as long as you don't just... The first thing you say, you say, well, this must be accurate. We have good information, good resources. So what are you doing to keep growing spiritually? What will you do this week to grow spiritually? Number three, stop excusing sin as a way of life. This is all in the idea of how do I apply, apply all this, apply it. Stop excusing sin as a way of life. I said nothing about Jesus' temptation But I did say that Jesus was sinless. That does not mean that he was sinless, that he did not feel temptation. So so this idea that he's the God-man, so since he's God, that means, it does mean he was sinless. But you're incorrect if you say because he was sinless, he did not feel temptation. He felt it. He felt the full fury of Satan unleashed, tempting him. Read Matthew 4. The devil left him for a season, but he came back. He he felt it. So I'm going to encourage you, stop excusing sin as a way of life. Paul asked the question, shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? Romans 6.1. God forbid, how shall we die to sin, live any longer there in it? So stop excusing sin as, well, it's just in my nature. I have to sin. No, you've, if you're in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, and you are to progressively die to sin as a ruling principle in your life. Number four, embrace salvation. Sin and death came through our first human parents. The the remedy of Adam's sin, the the result of that sin was sin and punishment, physical and eternal death. But the remedy came through the second Adam, who himself, as a human, bore our sin, our guilt, without becoming a sinner. So embrace this. If you've never trusted Jesus, trust Him as your Savior. The one who died for you. Believe on Him. Trust Him. Receive Him. And then the last one I'll give you is have hope in suffering. Have hope in suffering. Christ lived in an earthly... He lived in a body and He retains that body. He suffered in a body. Are you suffering physically? Are you suffering emotionally, mentally? Christ can relate to you. Have hope in suffering. So this morning, I've sought to show you something of the humanity of Jesus. 
We've seen the one record we have of his life between his birth and the beginning of his ministry. We've seen some considerations from Luke 2.52 that he increased in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. And five specific ways to apply, apply this section to our lives. Jesus, here it is, if you put it in a sentence, Jesus assumed a human nature without separating his or, or doing away with his divine nature. He, he added it. He came into our world a perfect, beautiful, wonderful Savior. He entered into our world and he added to that sinless divine nature our human nature. His body was crucified, he was buried, and he was raised. If you're a Christian, press on to know him. And if you're not a Christian, this Jesus, who is both God and man, feels exactly where you are, and he will save you. He will carry you, Christian, through whatever you're walking through if you look to him. Let's pray together. As we bow our heads and close our eyes, I'm going to ask you to, as much as you can, to just pray this passage in, to think on it, to, to contemplate the depth of the, the reality that Jesus is not only divine, but he's human. Perhaps there's a sin that you need to bring before him in confession. Perhaps there's some action steps that you need to write down regarding what you're going to do to grow spiritually. Perhaps there are some changes that need to happen in your life where you begin to pursue the Lord as never you have before. I'm going to ask that we just all pray. I'm going to join you. In a moment, we'll sing together. And listen closely as we, we really blend two songs together, uh, particularly uh, one of the songs that will just so, I think, poignantly echo what this passage has told us about the person of Jesus. So let's pray together.